Good afternoon, everybody. It's absolutely lovely to see all of you here. My name is Joy, as you have heard. I come from Nairobi, Kenya, and I'm very happy to be here today. Ironically, right now in Kenya, it's quite cold. So I think I'm the only person in the room who is so appreciative of all the heat and humidity. It's made me feel right at home. So let's get right into it. You can keep time for me. Thank you. Um, I'm asking him to keep time because I am prone to speaking and speaking and speaking. And so I'll try and be mindful of uh, Jared's uh, indications. Now, ideological colonization. I don't know if you're familiar with this term. That's something that I want to explore a little bit uh, before. So I come from Kenya, and this is a country that was once upon colonized by the British. And this colonization, what it does is people who feel like they, they're, they're a little bit better than you come in and occupy your country, and they help you with a few of the things that you find problematic, like, you know, health care and other things. But at the same time, they take the opportunity to help themselves to some of the things that you have in your territory and take them back home. So that was our history with colonization. So Africa, there's this big uprising. And in the 50s, we all get uh, liberated from our colonizers, and we thought that that was the end of it. But what has happened now is fast forward where we are now, where we are seeing a different kind of engagement with um, the West. Now, I, I would like from the onset to say I'm communicating this with a lot of love and respect because I recognize I'm talking about most of your communities. So please don't take this offensively. Allow me to just communicate my truth. Don't see it as a, an attack. It's just a, a stating of what it is. And so people come into our societies and tell us, you know what? Uh, we've been looking at your healthcare policies and they're all very well and good, but you know what? We think we can help you to improve how you do it, and this is how you can do it. And so we find lobbyists and people who come in to sort of assist us in this situation. And so we find ourselves in a situation whereby we have a new kind of colonization, where you find there's one way of thinking, there's one way of communicating, there's one way of looking at things, and if you do things a little bit different, get a little slap on the wrist that tells you, ah, 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 that's not how it should be. Maybe you ought to do this in a different way. Religious liberty is one of those liberties that have been hard fought throughout humanity. Look at any civilization. When it comes to religion, people get very passionate about it. And the reason for this is because it's very subjective. You believe with all of you. And so when somebody tries to take that away, it becomes a little bit offensive. And what we have right now, and let me talk about Kenya, is a situation where we have seen more and more attacks on our conscience rather than on things that are really a problem. So in the year 2010, Kenya was passing a new constitution. There was the agitation to pass a new constitution. And like I said earlier, we had people who were constitutional experts who came to help us to write a new constitution. And one of the things that we noticed was that a lot of the language that was used in our new constitution was very, for lack of a better word, UN language you know, inclusive, accommodative, and all these vague terms that you really have to struggle to define. But what they do is that they create little pockets and little avenues for them to be expounded on. And this expounding on, you find mischief. So for example, uh, Article 26 of our Constitution talks about the right to life. So it tells us, one, you have a right to life. Two, Life begins at conception and ends in natural death. Sounds good so far, right? Mm -hmm. Then three, nobody can take away your right unless the law says so, to give room for death penalty, which we still have. And then it says four, this is a curious one. Abortion is not permitted unless, in the opinion of a medical professional, the life or health of the mother is at risk, and therefore, in that situation, legislation can be passed to secure her life or health. You see where the problem is. So you've given this entire elaborate, very clear, succinct provision for life. But something is introduced that sort of leaves the leeway for legislation to be passed to allow for abortion for the sake of life or health. Now, what we had before is where the life of the mother was at stake, then an abortion could be permitted, even though it was generally zero policy on abortion. But now we had this little thing also called where her health 
was concerned. So we go to the WHO definition for health. Health is cultural, social, economic, psychological. You know, it, I mean, health is, is just as long as you're happy, you're healthy. If you're not happy, you're not healthy. And so we found ourselves in a situation where our very laws were being used to change the culture and the conscience. And so there was born a big pushback. Hence, something like the East Africa Center for Law and Justice. We started immediately after the Constitution was passed because we realized some of that activity had to be carried, the conversation had to be carried forward beyond the passing of the Constitution. This ideological colonization has found its way not just being pushed through legislation, but also being pushed through um, looking for the cultural change using legislative means. Now, in America, you understand this well, because you had the, past, the constitutional decision in Roe versus Wade that opened the door to abortion. So at the time when Roe v. Wade was passing, abortion was actually something that was quite reprehensible in the general American community. But because of the law changing, the culture was sort of changed to be in step with what had now become law. And now we are seeing that tactic now being applied to where I'm from, and which is why I guess I'm speaking with you today, because of the work that we are trying to do to push back against this. So early last year, we had the, I should have got the correct, the long term for it, but I forget, the ICBD 25. And they were trying to have a conversation about how to advance the agenda of for, allow me to use it in its narrow sense, the gay agenda, and I hope you understand what I mean by that, to try and advance the gay agenda in African communities. There's an interesting thing about Kenya, and which makes it unique in this uh, spectrum of colonization. South Africa is quite liberal, very liberal, in fact. In fact, um, it's more um, aligned to Europe and the Americas than the rest of Africa. But for some reason, their influence has got, not gone beyond their borders. The north of Africa, on the other hand, is very Islamic. And so there obviously lies the problem for this agenda. It's dead on arrival. The west of Africa has a mix. It has Islamic and Christian influences, but they're also bereft with very many problems, Boko Haram and all this and that. They're quite preoccupied with other things. The only place that is kind of open is East Africa. When you look at East Africa, Kenya sits in a situation, in a position where it is surrounded by six other countries. So that means if something is available and accessible in Kenya, even if it is not legal or acceptable in the other countries, Everybody can access Kenya easily by virtue of the East African community. We have free access in and out in, within the community. And so we become a place where a lot of emphasis has been put. We currently have a situation where there is, how do I put it? It's in concert. We are seeing a concert, an agreement of activity between Western governments, Western NGOs and other um, actors as well as the United Nations. Now, why the United Nations is important in all this is because they're generally accepted to be working for the good of all. They're trying to advance human rights. They're not a particular society. They represent everybody. So we cannot say these are just American rights or these are this country's rights. This is everybody. So you find in Kenya, it's. I think the only country in Africa that actually has a UN base. And so we get a lot of activity coming in because of being headquarters for UN Habitat and for UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program. But now we have a lot of activity from the UNFPA, from UN Women, from UNICEF. So for example, on my telephone, I have messages directly sponsored by UNICEF trying to talk to me about vaccination of my children. So you find a situation where, by, acquiescion of, uh, by acquiescence by the government, these foreign actors are able to work directly with the Kenyan populations because they allowed this access. Now, would this happen in another community where you're told, you know what, make sure you take your children for the measles jab? And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, uh, why should I do that? My, the government is not telling me it's UNICEF. 
When you go to the government, they tell you, oh, yes, yes, we are aware about it, please collaborate. Ideological colonization is a threat to religious liberty because oftentimes you find a situation where because of the power and the influence that they yield and they have uh, with our legislators, they are able to, in most part, convince them that this is what is good for us. So uh, one of the major problems with this is a lack of awareness of what this is. So we've been having a discussion about this before we came. And one of the things we have noticed is this days the language, one sentence means something totally different. And so people do not seem to understand when there is a danger. So for example, let me use a term like inclusivity. If I say inclusivity here, many people would take in, 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 immediately should go like wokeness. It is, you know, a woke term. If you say inclusivity in Kenya, people think you want to include everybody. And so when they put this in legislation and they tell the legislators, look, we are looking for a more inclusive society, what they understand is that we are trying to get everybody at the table and everybody provided. They do not understand the difference in connotation. And so that makes our work difficult because sometimes you tell them that this thing is not good for us, but the people reading it are like, which part of it is not good? Look at it. There's nothing insidious about it. There's nothing hidden. It's all written down. Through the years, the suggestions have been very subtle. So the changes have not come in an avalanche. The changes have come with, you know, one little law here, a little policy there, a little policy there. And eventually, we find ourselves mired in this situation where the society has to change now to adopt with what is our new norm. So for example, once upon a time, if a woman wanted uh, family planning services, she had to get it by herself. She had to go to an OBGYN and have a consultation about it and be able to be given the service. But now we're in a situation where, thanks to donations and to grants, we are able to get this for free in any government institution without any participation by a doctor. So if you just walk in and tell them, I want, in fact, this is literally what people say, I want family planning. So which one do you want? Do you forget to take pills every day? So we can't give you the pill, you'll forget to take the pill. So maybe we give you a three month injection. That's how casually the, the thing goes. No, how old are you? Did you come with your husband? There's no discussion around it. But this is something that is sanctioned and allowable. Because Jared has signaled me and I still have two pages. Let me just skip two. It's not all doom and gloom. Let me skip to that bit. The rest we'll do in the Q&A. It's not all doom and gloom because one, we are also getting woke. We, I'm talking about the conservative side, the pushback that they like, they call, like calling us the pushback. We are getting aware of these things a little bit more often. So we're more vigilant. Every legislation, every policy that comes out, we are trying to keep up as much as possible. And so they're finding it harder and harder and harder to pass things under the table and then we find out after they are passed, which I think is an excellent thing. Another thing, it has forced us to get organized. For a long time, the churches just used to issue threats. Or we'll organize our people to reject that. Or we will call our numbers to reject that. And of course, before long, they found ways of circumventing that. Now we are getting more organized. We are getting think tanks. We are putting more thought into it. And we are becoming proactive. We are not waiting for them to give us solutions. Now in places where there are gaps. So for example, we are working on a family protection law because we realize that abortion law in clause in the constitution, if it stays as is, eventually there will be legislation to give us abortion on demand. So we are working on a child pro family protection law before that happens, that we make provisions for everything early. Another thing it has also helped us is to collaborate. I looked at the program and I've realized that that is also the spirit here, where different like-minded groups are learning to work together. Before we were doing plenty of siloing, and you know, you all do your own little thing in your little corners, but now we are learning the power of coming together. So I started talking about the ICPD 25. One of the ways we were able to torpedo that um, conference, it went on and they made some declarations, but the impact was not as much, was because we got everybody from the Holy See to the embassies of friendly countries to ourselves as well as NGOs and civic, uh, civic actors, and the pushback was 
strong and powerful to the extent that even our government had to agree that maybe they should have thought about it a little bit before they allowed the conference to go with the stature that it did. And finally, one of the, sorry, one of the things that Kenya has also been able to do is also start talking to the other countries and make them aware of what is going on. So a country like Uganda, where the proliferation is not as much, you'll find that President Museveni is a lot more outspoken about it because our president has kind of gotten compromised a little bit and so sometimes he's hamstrung. But Museveni will come out and President Museveni will come out and speak very powerfully about it. Or the late Magufuli was also very good at speaking very powerfully against vaccination and other things. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that is my time, and I hope we collaborate a little bit more during the Q&A. God bless you. Thanks for watching the Heritage Foundation's YouTube channel. With more than half a million members, we are the nation's largest conservative research and education institution. We believe the principles and ideas of the American founding are worth conserving and renewing. Please help us further our mission by subscribing to this channel and sharing our videos with your family and friends.